Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to Software Engineering. As always, I'm Bart Massey. As always, I hope you're staying safe and well out there in these very difficult times. I sincerely do. Today, I want to talk to you a little bit about the workflow that teams tend to use today with Git and GitHub. And that's, when I say teams tend to use it, it's certainly the default in the open source community, but I think it's the default these days for a lot of industry projects as well. It's just too nice a workflow to not use and steal. And so let's talk a little bit about how that goes and uh, how you might use it. So first of all, what's a workflow? What am I even talking about? Well, it's what it sounds like, right? It's how does work proceed in a project? And again, there's lots of parts to the software engineering workflow, but the Git plus GitHub part, I'm going to use Git and GitHub today for my examples because that's the most common thing out there these days. A lot of this is not going to be dramatically different no matter what you're using, but I really feel like this is the thing that's going to be most relevant to you to start out with. It's also the one I'm the most familiar with, so there. Uh, so it's a workflow. It's just the way of doing work. And the first thing to understand about the standard Git workflow is it's built around a sort of a star model. And by that I mean even though Git allows for lots of distributed re repositories to stay in sync, on your project, it's proven useful as an organizational tool to have one sort of central blessed sort source of truth. And that's what we refer to as the upstream repository. Typically it's the one that is sort of the repository that everybody wants to make their stuff match and the one that we don't want to change except deliberately and carefully. And that's a pretty standard part of most group Git setups. So in this star model, we have the upstream repo, but also sitting on GitHub, also sitting there next to it are typically what are called forks of that repo, and each developer typically has their own. So one of the first things that happens in this workflow is that you all set up your own repos for the particular project that mirror the central repository as much as possible. And that makes it convenient to use the GitHub tools to do your work. I'll show you that in a bit. But also, locally on your local machine on the other end of the internet from GitHub is a repository typically that's sort of a mirror of your downstream repository. And so now your workflow typically consists of getting things from upstream and downstream into your local thing, doing some work, pushing back up to upstream. So to set that all up, it turns out that the best plan is to make, typically, is to make a GitHub organization for your project. And that's the, and that organization contains the project repo or repos that you're going to work on. A lot of organizations will have several related projects that each have their own repositories. And we typically try to make all the devs have as much possible power as they can over that central repository, over the organization repository, because especially in an agile model, especially in a scrum style model, it may be necessary. That said, uh, it's not uncommon to, uh, have somebody or some smaller group of people be the people who have to approve any kind of substantive changes to the repository just so that it doesn't all descend into chaos as people hack on things. Poking at the upstream repository without the team's fairly explicit consent in weird ways is generally a good way to get yourself rapidly disliked and disapproved of by the entire team. This is sort of an artifact that everybody's trying to maintain as a pristine jewel. So let's take a look. I'm just going to go as we do this and sort of run through some stuff. So this is my personal page and 
it contains, among other things, sorry, that's probably too much, the a list of the organizations that I'm a member of. For most of these, I'm the actual owner and creator of these organizations. I, I thought for today we'd use the one that we've already seen some of, which is our courses uh, software engineering projects repository that has a lot of our demo code and stuff. So let's click into this organization. You can create one if you don't have one. They're free. They allow unlimited members. And you'll notice we have the projects that we've worked on in our class. I'm going to play today with the build demo. And so I'm going to pretend that I'm not, you know, that I'm just another member of a team working on this build demo project. And so the first thing I'm typically going to do is click into this project and hit the fork button to make a fork. So I'm going to make my own little downstream repository that mirrors the build demo repository. Now fork here is one of those overloaded loaded words that probably isn't a very good word for what's going on here. Uh, GitLab calls it something else that I can't remember, but the basic idea here is that I'm going to essentially clone the repository into my own downstream space says it should only take a few seconds and it typically does and then now I've got my own and you'll notice it says oh this is forked from the software engineering you know from the software engineering organizations build demo so that's fantastic and now I'm ready to sort of start working with the team on the project I now can do things with my downstream repository and only get things into the upstream repository once I'm really super confident that they're the things that I actually want to have happen. So let's uh, let's make a clone of that repository. By the way, get oh well, I'll talk about that later. But let's uh, make a clone of that repository somewhere. We'll make it off in slash temp today. And so the first thing I'm going to do is make a writable clone. If you can't remember how to do that, there's instructions here somewhere about how to uh, how to actually um, make a clone of this repository. But the short version is that I take the repository URL right out of the web browser and paste it in. I'm going to actually change it to an SSH URL because I use SSH for authentication. You can use HTTPS, but you end up typing a lot of passwords you might not want to. So I'm going to take and pull down. And so now we have sort of associated with me two different things. We have my upstream repo on GitHub, and we have my down, my local repo, sorry, my downstream repo on GitHub. We have my local repo here, and they're connected together in such a way that when I make changes here, I can push them up there. So let's say that, so let me change into that thing. Now I've got a working directory. Now I'm ready to do work. Um, I might want to look at what branches are available. It looks like there's only the master branch. By the way, I'll mention this later, but the current, thing for arguably good reasons is to not use the name master anymore. GitHub has already changed it so that when you make new repositories using GitHub, the default branch is called main and everybody's moving to main pretty quickly. If you want to have your local repositories like that, then you can say this, you can say git config dash dash global init dot default branch main. And from then on, when you say git init to make a new repository, it will call it main. But I did this before that. So this one's called has a branch called master. This is sort of the default branch where everybody does work. Let's make a new branch so that we can make some changes here. Uh, git checkout minus b uh, and there's some newer modern way of doing this, but I can't remember it anymore. Let's see, git checkout minus b, what are we going to call this? Simplification. We'll make it the simplification branch. We're going to, or let's make it actually the remove mason branch. We're going to get rid of mason in our thing. So now we're going to actually 
remove mace so now if we say get branch we'll find out we're on the remove mason branch we're going to actually um do some edits and then we're going to push stuff back up let me go back to my notes for a second because i can't remember what i'm doing right and so the idea here is that typically in a larger organization the upstream repository the organization repository would have a master branch and would also have a dev branch for a large project. For smaller projects, you might not bother, and I'm not gonna bother in this case, but I really don't wanna push anything directly into the upstream repository, because if I do, you know, who knows if people wanted that, etc. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to always start changes with get pull on master or main, whatever. Let's see, so, you know, I just created this repository, so this won't do anything, but a good habit to get into is to always make sure that your thing matches upstream, and in fact, I might even want to um, do this. Get remote add URL upstream slash, uh, in fact, let's just make this be an HTTP URL so that we don't ever accidentally write on it. GitHub.com slash PDXCSSE slash build a demo. Whoops. What is it telling me? Add URL, oh yeah, remote add. There we go. So now we've added that, and if I say get remote list, uh, get remote, just with nothing. I have two things now, and if I say get remote show origin, it shows that my origin repository, the default one I'm gonna interact with now is my downstream repository up on GitHub. But if I look at the upstream one, uh, you'll notice it's the one that's the organization repository. And so it's usually a good idea to pull from upstream at the start of a session. And it's telling me that I haven't told it what branch to pull from. It says, oh, we're already up to date. If I wasn't, then I have some work to do because things have changed under me. And so now I probably want to get push uh, to the default branch, which is origin. I want to get push, and that will um, make sure that the that'll make sure that my downstream repository is in sync with the uh, upstream repository up on GitHub. But now I'm in a position where I know my stuff is all good. I've, I'm all up to date, so I can check out that branch. You know, I can check out that branch if I haven't already. <sighs> what was it called again? So let's make a change. Um, that seems like a thing to do. Um, I'm going to say, well, I don't want to support Mason anymore, so let's fix that. There'll be a few things to fix here. I want to get rid of, oh, there's nothing in the make file, obviously. I always make that typo. So let's see. So it's not a demo of using make Mason and CMake anymore. It's just using make and CMake, which is a choice that could have happened. We'll get rid of these instructions. And now this is up to date. And I shouldn't have said rmmason.build. I should have said git rmmason.build, but fortunately git will figure out what's going on when that happens. And now let's commit our changes. See it, notice that we deleted mason.build, but you shouldn't count on that. Um, removed mason from option, from supported builds. All right, so now we got a new commit here. And now what am I gonna do? Well, 
I'm gonna push back up to this thing and it's called remove mason is the name of the branch. See, up till now, nothing I've done, if I don't commit, if I don't push this, then I've got a perfectly good local branch. I can work on this code, make more commits, do whatever I want. Nobody outside this working directory can uh, see my changes at all. So this is a great way when I'm just working on something, don't want anybody to see it yet. That's fantastic, but eventually I'm gonna want people to see my stuff. And in that situation, I'll push it and it will now make a new branch upstream on my downstream up on github so if i go to my downstream up here on github i will find out that uh let's i'll probably need to reload it because welcome to the things and there should be now a somewhere oh i see it's just i think my font's just too big yeah there we go sorry about that i'm gonna have to make the fonts a little smaller for it to all work that there's a remove mason version there's also the old within curses branch which i pushed up after last week and so there's lots of branches sitting on this project but now we have a new one and this is just on mine if i go to the parent repository the organization repository it's not there yet because I haven't made that change there yet. Um, and you'll notice that it notices that this repository I forked, my downstream repository, it had recent pushes. You might wanna make a pull request and get them. Um, so that's a thing. And you'll notice we don't have that branch here yet. I can put that there if I want to. So what I'm probably gonna do is just threaten to move these changes directly onto master. So I'll make what's called a pull request. So I'm gonna compare and pull request. So now I'm not just gonna push stuff directly up to the upstream repository because I want people to look at it first. And it's a limitation of GitHub that I can't create a new branch with a pull request. GitLab doesn't have that limitation, but there we are. But I can try to push it onto master. And that's probably what I want to do anyway, right? I want to take my change, since it, I thought it was an approved change that we wanted to do, and push it up onto the master repository. It says these are automatically mergeable. Here's where I say what I'm trying to do. Um, and I give a more detailed description. Uh, you know, whatever it says. And then I can push this create pull request button. Oh, and I can also review the pull request. I can compare the changes here. Preview, right? And I can see what the changes actually look like. And oh, here's the commits. And then it shows the changes in those commits. And I look at it before I make the pull request to make sure I'm happy with what I did, but it looks fine, so let's just go with it. And what we'll do then is go back to the right thing, say, yeah, this looks like a decent pull request. Create pull request. Woot, we have requested a pull. At this point, the typical workflow is that the person on the other end the, the, the team as a whole, somebody notices there's a pull request. And so I click on the pull request thing and there is one and here it is. And now somebody who's not me, somebody who's one of the developers can look this over, review all the things that are on it. I can preview it, I can uh, click on it to see what the commit looks like. And if I decide that I want to put this in the upstream repository as a manager of that upstream repository, once I've reviewed it, I push this merge pull request button, which I'm not going to do because I don't actually want this pull request <laughs> dropped onto master. And so instead, I can make leave a comment that says, uh, 
we don't want this uh, please talk to the team about it and I can close with comment uh, no I don't want your pull request now of course the other possibility was just to take the pull request so this is the normal workflow when you've gone through this workflow when you when you use this workflow it's a smooth, nice workflow that means that everybody stays on the same page as far as what's going on. It keeps this upstream repository in decent shape. Uh, I can now try to accommodate changes that are requested in the in the for the pull request. You know that I get back. Uh, so yeah, I, you see, I got this comment back. That gives us a chance to have a conversation about what should be going on with the pull request if it was left open, and then I might go ahead and commit changes again in which case the pull request they can choose to take it now or not and so this process of going back and forth with pull requests is a good workflow for a medium-sized github project and even for a large project get github project and even for a large project because it preserves your it provides maximum insulation from mistakes or bad ideas while still allowing work to get done without wasting too much time on messing around with Git. So I'm going to actually remove this whole downstream repository. Nope, that's the upstream repository. This is the downstream repository. Don't remove the wrong one. So I'm going to undo all this, I think, because it served its purpose. Let's go through the rest of the talk and then I'll do that at the end. So we do work on a local branch, push it up to, to my downstream repo, then pull request it to get it on the central, the upstream repo. Somebody reviews it or not. And if you're working with a separate dev branch, which isn't a terrible idea for a larger project, then there might be a day when you come along and remove all the work that's on dev, you merge it with master. So that's part of using Git and GitHub. Another part of using Git and GitHub is that it provides you with a whole bunch of resources for managing your project. And probably the most important of these are the pull request manager, which we've already seen, and the issue tracker. What's the issue tracker? Well, if I go down to where the, again, this thing is not optimized for tiny fonts. I guess I can use this side. Nope, that's, oh, I'm on the wrong, I'm not on the repo. Oh, that's embarrassing. So if I look at this upstream repo, there's going to be an issue tracker over here that's one of the things listed in the project up at the top. And you'll notice there are no issues posted on this, but there could be. We could go onto this and create an issue uh, like this. So let's make a new issue. Uh, need to remove Mason support as confusing. So this, it's not a bad idea to never do a pull request except against an outstanding issue. I was showing you the process, but honestly, this process of making changes to the software, a good way to do it is to start by filing an issue, saying what it is you plan to do to the software, and then there can be discussion and a record of why it's being done. Uh, I we f I found Mason to be too confusing. This is Markdown, and I highly encourage you to use the Markdown to make it uh, better. We should remove support for it. Once I hit this, hit um, hit this whole. Uh, submit new issue thing on this, there'll be a new issue in the issue tracker. I'm not going to do it because I'm realizing that sort of the, the, I don't want a, the Mason team to find this. Let's do something else. Um, confused about, <laughs> confusing with GitHub. This project is confusing to use with GitHub. There we go. There's a thing. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to um, hit new issue on this. 
And once you've seen that, once I've filed an issue against this, then that issue is visible in the issue tracker and it's noted that there's an open issue. Notice that the issue is open now. I could choose, for example, to close the issue, which is what I'm gonna do. Always be polite in your messages. And we'll close with comment. Yeah, I don't believe in this dumb issue. It's a dumb issue. And there we are. And now um, that issue is still in the issue tracker. It doesn't go away. It's just that there's no open issues. Um, there's one closed issue. And that way you always have a record of everything you've ever talked about. You'll never lose this stuff. It's hard to even explicitly delete it. You'll notice there's one comment on this issue and I can open up and look at it again if I want to. So the issue tracker is awesome. You should be using it with your projects. Uh, I've lost track of where I was in my notes. There we go. There's also a project board, which is a new thing in GitHub. I can go and create, <coughs> excuse me, a new project board for this project. And uh, that will help me manage the project. Organize your issue with project boards, create a project. And so what this does is lets us build a sort of a Kanban board, a board where we can put story cards and that kind of stuff. So, uh, I don't care, it's got, that's a terrible name. Status of the build demo project. And now I've got a thing. I'm gonna not use a template, I think. Eh, maybe. Basic Kanban with to do in progress and done, whatever you wanna do. And now I've got this funky project boardy thing. It will actually take your issues and move them in as cards on the task if you have open issues uh, automatically. And then it will also provide you these things. I'm gonna shrink, there again, I'm gonna shrink the interface so you can see what's going on a little. Um, there's three to-dos that are marked here. And there's also, and you can scroll down through those if you can figure out how, uh, that are just get started with the project board. And then there's in progress tasks and there can be done tasks, you know, and done tasks as once you have done tasks, you can add to another column. And so it's all pretty nice way to manage your project scrum is to use something like this. This is less mandatory. You may choose to use some other tool, but this isn't a bad tool for this. The other thing is that there's GitHub Pages, which allows you to build web pages for your project. There's also the wiki, which I've found to be an underused feature of these things, but is a pretty reasonable wiki integrated with GitHub. So you can actually create a wiki, which that is editable, you know, user editable web pages with stuff like this. Uh, and this can be managed with Git or it can be managed from the GitHub web interface and is a really convenient place to put, to organize documentation and notes and that kind of stuff. So those are the kind of capabilities that GitHub provides, right? Notice the difference between Git and GitHub here. Git is a tool for source code management. GitHub is a website integrated with Git, with integrated Git for managing Git but they're not the same thing. It's one of those things, you know, Wikipedia is not, you know, the wiki is not the same thing as Wikipedia. Wikipedia as a week. Let me try that again. A wiki is not the same thing as Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a kind of wiki. Similarly, GitHub is not Git. GitHub is a tool that lets you use Git better. The last thing is, you know, a lot of this was probably confusing. Uh, Git. Hub, Git and GitHub are always confusing when you're starting out. The GitHub tutorials that you can find there on GitHub are actually 
quite nice and I can recommend them. They walk you through processes really pretty well. I can give you help with this stuff as you get started, but a lot of it is just using it, just banging on it and messing with it and trying to understand what it can and can't do. And so really the best way in a lot of ways is to use stuff to learn it. Look it up or ask for help when you need to, but mostly you'll get familiar with the stuff that you're actually using. So that's what I've got for you today. I hope that was useful. Uh, again, please stay safe and well out there. I thank you for listening and I look forward to talking to you again soon.